So I'd like to start this morning with, uh, with the reading of the text. We're in 2 Timothy chapter 2. You can follow along on the screens uh, behind me. But it says, So you, my child, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, in which you heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful people who will be competent to teach others as well. Take your share of suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one in military service gets entangled in matters of everyday life. Otherwise, he will not please the one who recruited him. Also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he will not be crowned as the winner unless he competes according to the rules. The farmer who works hard ought to have the first share of the crops. Think about what I'm saying, and the Lord will give you understanding of all of this. Let's pray that the Lord gives us understanding. God, thank you so much for this great church. Thank you for the privilege that we have to gather together, to center around your word. Now we pray, Father, that as we've gathered together, that you speak only as you can. Tune our ears to your voice so that we might hear you. Turn our hearts towards you so that we might experience the fullness of your grace. God, it is to that end that I ask that you stand in my body, think in my mind, and speak through my vocal cords those things you would have us say, know, and do. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, you are our strength and our redeemer. Get glory in this place. And all God's people said. So a couple weeks ago, about mid-July or so, Charlie and I went to the father-son super sleepover at Mahoning Valley Christian Camp. That is a whole lot to say. That's a mouthful right there. But it was a lot of fun, right? Uh, And so it was just like a one-night thing, 24-hour period, a chance for dads and their young boys to bond. And one of those games that we did to bond together. We were outside, and I don't know if you've ever been there or not, but there's like a worship shelter-like thing, and then you, we sent all the boys in, and there was maybe 18, 20 of us dads standing out there, and they said, okay, so now we're going to task you with something. You have to come up with something to do, like clap your hands, hop on one foot, whistle, sing, twitch randomly or something like that, and try and get your son to mimic you. And they said, make sure it's simple because, I mean, you know, they're going into first grade, kindergarten, they're not super old or anything. And so uh, make sure it's something that they can do and won't get frustrated with. So, you know, we're all thinking about different things that we're going to do, and we all walk in together, and we sit next to our sons who are watching a worship video on the screen, and I chose to whistle, right? And so I'm, I walk in, and I'm whistling, and I think I just settled in on the Andy Griffith song because that's the only whistle song I know. So I walk in, I'm like, <laughs> right? And, and, and then I sit down, and Charlie just kind of looks up at me. He knows the song, right? And he just kind of smiles, and he looks back at the screen. And then I just keep whistling, and he looks back up at me, and then he has like this like puzzled face, like he's like, what are you doing? You know, but other dads are doing a lot more weirder things, like waving their hands in the air, like they just don't care, right? And, uh, and so I, I thought to myself, you know, I don't know if Charlie knows how to whistle. And I was a little late on that one, I suppose, and so... And so I, I started doing something a little simpler. Uh, I did the little tweet sound or the Twitter sound, you know. Like, you ever hear that? People's phones go off. You hear that sound? Yeah. And so I just start doing, and no, he can't whistle. He can't whistle at all. And so he's, I'm, I'm like, well, this was a failure on all fronts, wasn't it? And so, uh, but the point was obviously, for the sons to, to mimic their fathers, right? To, to have that relationship, to try and get him to copy what I am doing and to show us that what we do affects our children, affects our sons, because they're always watching, they're always mimicking, they're going to pick up what you are doing. And perhaps there's a bit of nature versus nurture in all of that. Like, you know, as far as, is it ingrained into them? Is it observable behavior? That is an argument for another time. 
but there is certainly a correlation between the relationship of father and son or parent and child and that of discipling somebody. Now today, I want to talk about discipleship. I am the discipleship minister after all, and, and so I'm very passionate about this and, and what we have been tasked with in the New Testament for making disciples who make disciples. And Paul begins this section with perhaps the most intimate of language that he could give, and that is, so you, my child, so you, my child, as he's writing to Timothy, and he's, he's, Timothy has had the opportunity and the chances, chances to observe Paul, to see him, to mimic him. And he begins this language, so you, my child. It reveals the type of relationship between a disciple maker and a disciple. Now, perhaps you might be thinking like, Okay, sharing the gospel or sharing the good news. Is that discipling? Well, yeah, there's actually kind of a difference in the terminology between evangelizing and discipling. Evangelizing is kind of the initial go around, and then discipling is you know, the rest of that person's life. So I often define discipling as intentionally leading others toward a deeper allegiance to King Jesus. Now, I know that was wordy and everything. There's a lot of theology packed into all of that, but that's how I I've chosen to define it. That's actually how we define it. That's the official definition of our church on how we and what we say discipling is. Intentionally leading others toward a deeper allegiance to King Jesus. And so evangelizing is sharing or telling others what God has done in your life. For example, Jesus forgave my sins and now I'm free. That's something that God has done for you discipling is showing others what God is doing in your life. So here's how I choose to live out my freedom in Christ on a daily basis. And you're showing them uh, the decisions that you make day in and day out on how you faithfully serve Christ as, as king. But you know, we're living in a society, in a country that is pretty anti-discipling, right? Because it's built into the DNA of America that this is an individualistic, build yourself up by your bootstraps kind of community. And we find our pride in that, in that we are successful and we're successful on our own merits without needing any help, right? That is part of the identity of being an American and it started all the way back at our nation's beginning. But you know, as that mentality begins to infect the church, we begin to build up barriers, not just fences between our houses, but also fences in our relationships. And we say things like, you know, how about you just mind your own business, right? How dare you stick your nose into my life, and I certainly won't stick my nose into your life except for when I do, right? Because we all know that we do, right? And so we have built these barriers to where discipling is just not something that is natural to who we are as a people. And as a result, the church in America has lost the ability to disciple others. Now, about in the 80s and in the 90s, small group culture, small group ministry began to like explode, right? And so you started hearing things like small group ministers, right? And that's kind of where I come from, discipleship ministry. And then in the, in the 2000s, they began to realize that small group ministry just wasn't enough, that it was just another way for people to gather together, but there wasn't really any growth happening in those small groups. And so then they started narrowing in on, on, the, uh, on the New Testament example of discipling, uh, this rabbinic style of discipleship, and began writing all kinds of books. And, and that's the environment that I went to Bible college in and have come out of. And so I see the importance and, and, and the effect that that has had on our community as uh, believers uh, across our nation. That, that when we hone in on what it means to truly disciple somebody, that we can see growth. And we can see growth from people who perhaps weren't going to, to have that in just their normal church setting. But you know, the church, even though it's lost the skill of discipling, it is beginning to pick it up again. 
And you hear these excuses that people give, really, as to why they don't, like, why they don't disciple someone else or, or why they don't want to be discipled. And, and it's the same excuses, truthfully, that Paul heard in his own day. And so today, what I want to talk about is not so much like the different stages of development. I've given those sermons, taught those lessons before. What I want to address today are the excuses that we might hear and the encouragement that Paul gives to overcome those excuses. So Paul confronts our modern problems for discipling with encouragement stemming from a simple gospel message. All right, so the first problem or excuse that I hear from people who don't disciple others is that of the ripcord. The ripcord. All right, so when I was in middle school, not only did I travel with my youth group uh, at the time to pay to get into Kings Island, but I took some additional money with me because me and my two closest friends thought it would be a great idea to do the extreme sky flyer. Tell me, church, do you know of what I speak? It is the dumbest ride at King's Island that you have to pay extra to get onto because it's that crazy. All right? And so we were just old enough. I don't remember how old we, are. we were. I mean, sixth, seventh grade or something like that. And my buddy uh, Andrew and, and Brandon went with me. And we were, so here's, if you've never been there, if you don't know what I'm talking about, here's what it is. All right? They put you in this body harness, put you up on a lift, and connect like the smallest of wires you've ever seen in your life to your back as you are all kind of tethered together. And then they bring you up 150 feet into the air, again, by this just measly little wire. And the only thing keeping you from meeting the Lord and having a successful flight is this body harness and wire. And so... Again, middle school, stupid, right? We don't know what we're doing. And so we're up in the air, and it just seems like as they're taking you up, they're like, oh, we're almost there, we're almost there, we're almost there. And it's like 20 minutes later, it feels like you're still going up, right? And you're 150 feet in the air, and then you hear on the faintest of the wind sounds, because you're so high up there, three, two, one, fly. And it's at that moment you're supposed to pull the ripcord. Right? Yeah, you have to pull your own ripcord. And so it's so that you can go in and fly. And, uh, and so you hear the faintest of the sounds. I mean, it's a bullhorn down on the, on the ground. But when you're up there and all the wind's blowing, it's like, three, two, one, fly. And nothing happens. All right? And I'm in the middle. Brandon, Andrew. Brandon's the one that's got the ripcord. And he does it again. Three, two, one, fly. And I look over at Brandon, I'm like, what's going on over there? He says, I'm going to need a minute. <laughs> you know, because it takes a lot of courage to pull that ripcord, right? And eventually he does, and we start sailing face down towards the earth, and eventually that wire catches and gets pulled taut, and you just start swinging back and forth. It, it was truly a lot of fun, uh, but not something that I would ever do again, uh, at least in my, in, in my adulthood. And so the problem of the ripcord is that you get ready. You get all geared up. You think you're ready to go to maybe jump into this new discipling thing, and then you lack the courage to pull the ripcord, all right? Maybe you've been there before in your own life with your own situation, but you know Paul has something that he wants to say to address that, and it's in verse 1. He says, so you, my child, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. See, everybody turn to your neighbor and say, be strong. How about one more time, a little more oomph, right? Be strong. All right, so yeah, thank you for participating today. And uh, you pulled the ripcord on that one, right? And, uh, and so all throughout the Bible, we see this encouragement 
to be strong, to be courageous. And we see it most condensed in the book of Joshua and, and then in Judges as well. Be strong and courageous, right? But it's really all throughout the Bible though, where we see this command because God knows that his people need to be encouraged to, to stand up for what they know to be true, to be right, and to do the righteous thing. So it's this recurring mantra all throughout the Bible. And Paul tells Timothy to live in God's favor. Have strength, have courage, be strong, because when you fail, you are still living in the grace of God. He, you are still have his favor. He has still bestowed his love and grace upon you. And so when you fail, it doesn't matter because he's going to pick you up and you can continue along. You can pick up right where you were. You know, one chapter earlier in verse 7, Paul tells Timothy, For God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. And so I think the point here is that we have to have the courage to pull the ripcord and trust that God will take care of the rest. Have the courage to pull the ripcord and God will take care of the rest. Well, the next encouragement that Paul gives to address the issue that I hear all the time is that you are salty. Now, that, you, that you're salty. Now, some of you who are, you know, may, might be around my, like, 34, I don't know. I, I don't know how long this phrase has been around, but have you ever heard someone say, you salty? You know, brush that salt off your shoulder. You know, you know what I'm saying? You know, okay, all right. It's being lost on everybody else, but at least you two get it, right? So, all right, so... The, <laughs> I grew up in you know, middle school, high school, the, 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 thing, the cool things that kids said then was, oh, you're salty, right? Which was a way of saying, you're making mountains out of molehills. Am I speaking your language now? All right, you're, you're getting upset over something that's not that significant. And so, the, <laughs> so when I say something like, oh, you're salty, that, I'm really meaning something a little bit different than, than that, right? What I'm talking about is that of the Dead Sea. All right, so the Dead Sea is full of salt, right? We all know that to be true. Nothing can grow in the Dead Sea because it has such a high uh, salt content. It can't grow. It can't sustain life. It's completely dead. And, and truthfully, they aren't exactly sure why it has so much salt in it, but they are sure of two things. The first is that it is the lowest point on the Earth's crust that people can go to. And so it is the lowest part on Earth, right? Right? And, uh, and so that has something to do with it. And the second part of that would then be it has all of these tributaries that flow into it, like the Jordan River, but no water flows out. All right, and so the water keeps flowing in, flowing in, flowing in, nowhere for it to go, so it just collects all of this salt from all the other water sources, which might be insignificant in the fresh water, but collects and condenses in the Dead Sea because there's nowhere for it to go. And let me ask you, are you a Christian who has become too salty? Are you a Christian who has all these different sources, spiritual sources, friends who pour into you, but you pour in, don't pour into anybody else and now have become spiritually dead on the inside? Well, look at what Paul says in verse 2. And what you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful people who will be competent to teach others as well. You see, what Paul is trying to tell Timothy is that you need to pour into others or you will become too salty and dry up. Don't be like the Dead Sea. Don't be so full of salt. Don't be so self-absorbent that you expect everybody to feed you, that you go to church and expect to be fed, that you go to study group and expect to be fed, that you come to all these different uh, maybe groups and, and you expect to be spiritually fed, but then never have the expectation of pouring into anybody else because when you do that, you just keep consuming and consuming and consuming and you never give you're going to become like the Dead Sea. 
And now, in fact, the, the Jordan River is being drawn from so much that it actually no longer reaches the Dead Sea. It's the main tributary that feeds into that, into that body of water, and the Dead Sea is drying up. And so, are you like the Dead Sea, drying up? Now, you read here that in trust, teach others. And you might be thinking, Jonathan, I'm not equipped to teach the Bible. I'm, I don't know all this. Do I really have to teach all these theological truths the, uh, and the whole story? I mean, there's more here than what, than what you, might, you might know or feel comfortable teaching somebody else. And, you know, I, I'm not so sure that Paul is saying that you need to, like, in classroom setting, teach the scriptures. What I think Paul is getting back to is that of the Great Commission, right? Go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, right? Mark talked about that last week. And then the second part of that is teach them to obey. So it's not like we're expecting you to teach some deep theological truths or, or exegete passages for somebody else. What we're asking you to do is to teach how you faithfully follow Christ in your own life. Teach obedience. Show them how you follow Jesus and remain faithful to him in the darkest, most difficult times of your life. Share that part with other people. You know, there's a, uh, this expectation now to, to pour into others, to show obedience, to pour into people who will be responsible with what you give them. So be strong to pull the ripcord, pour into someone else. Now Paul encourages readers to endure neck pain to endure neck pain. Now, Erica and I have just zoomed past the part in life where when we sleep, like, in your head's, like, kind of cockeyed a little bit, and you wake up, and your neck hurts. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, you ever have that happen to you? Yeah, so, you know, I remember the days not that long ago when I could just get up and just go on with my day and, you know, shake it off in, like, 20 minutes. Yeah, no, I've been nursing neck pain for three weeks now because I slept on it wrong one time. All right, so I've reached that stage in my life. Uh, Erica reached it a little bit sooner than I did, of course, because she's older than me. <laughs> she's not in here to defend herself, but she is. And, uh, and so last winter, uh, she was complaining about having some neck problems. And it was around Christmas time, which, of course, is also her birthday. And so I thought, well, you know, I could... It's been a long time since we've bought any pillows. I mean, our pillows are original. We've been married 13 years. So that's how old they are. And, uh, and so, <laughs> so, yeah, I can hear the murmuring. Yeah, that's a long time. Yeah, so I said, okay, well, I'll, I'll buy you a pillow. And I bought one of those Casper pillows, right? And it, it's like firm on the inside, soft on the outside. It's supposed to help with that. I, I don't know much about pillows. I, I was truthfully out of my depth on that sort of topic. <laughs> And, uh, and so I bought her this pillow. It was a $90 pillow. $90. I'm like, holy cow. That's incredible. And so I made fun of her for having a $90 pillow, of course, making all sorts of old jokes. And, uh, and, but you know what? I really want one myself now. <laughs> you know, sometimes discipling other people is a real pain in the neck. And maybe you've gotten into a situation in your life when you've been involved in someone else's life for maybe just a glimpse, and you got torn and tossed in the mess of their life, and you're like, uh-uh, I do not want to mess with that again because you're still dealing with the pain, right? Two or three weeks later, you're still nursing that neck pain. And I hear it all the time. You get involved in someone's life, and it's just, it's just messy. You, they start having to deal with all of their problems, help navigate their decisions. You have to show them what it means to faithfully make Christ-like decisions, and, and it can be incredibly difficult. But you know, Paul says in verse 3, take your share of suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. 
take your share of suffering. That's, that's not easy to hear, is it? It sounds like something else he says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. He says, my aim is to know him, to experience the power of his resurrection, to share in his sufferings, and to be like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. And then Peter is going to say something very similar in chapter 4, verse 13. He says, but rejoice in the degree that you have shared in the sufferings of Christ, so that when his glory is revealed, you may also rejoice and be glad. You see, I think the point that Paul, or the encouragement that he's wanting to give to address this particular issue, is to sacrifice for others. Sacrifice for others. And, and that's, that's difficult. That's not easy. That's a lot to ask. But you know, Christ sacrificed for us. He sacrificed it all. Isn't someone else worthy of our time who needs him? You know, when you sacrifice for somebody and it's out of a source of obligation, it's, it's not fun. It's, it, it's tedious. You, you don't ever want to do it again. But when you sacrifice for somebody out of a source of love, of godly love, and you see them the way that God sees them, it's enjoyment. It's something something to experience. There's nothing else like it. But now that Paul has given three encouragements to common excuses to discipling others, he now shows his readers three examples of what someone who does disciple others looks like and what their rewards will be. These are three similes or three examples to show Timothy what a successful disciple maker looks like. Follow along with me. The first is the soldier, verse 4. No one in military service gets entangled in matters of everyday life. Otherwise, he will not please the one who recruited him. You see, Paul is is using the example of the soldier. And and by the way, all three examples that we're going to see are examples of people who have to work incredibly hard to reach their goals. A soldier has to work incredibly hard to reach their goals their goal. And the issue that he's addressing here specifically with that of the soldier is dealing with distractions, right? Distractions come in all sorts of shapes and sizes in life, but a soldier has no time for the everyday distractions, the everyday issues. They have loftier goals because if they get entangled into the smaller issues of the day, then they won't be able to serve the people. They won't be able to serve the king or the kingdom. They have to stay focused. And the point that I think he's trying to get across is that we need to stay focused on mission. Stay focused on mission. Let me ask you, how busy are you? I mean, our our calendars fill up super fast and to the point where we have to plan like three, six months out just so that we can find openings on people's calendars to do things. And, And life fills up so fast. And you know what? I think we're secretly happy, proud when we have full calendars. We get some sort of twisted enjoyment out of it, perhaps, because it means that your life, it's a a false security that your life has significance and meaning. But the encouragement is to stay on focused, and you can't remain focused on the calling to make disciples who make disciples if you fill your calendar with all sorts of other things. I, I know that's not easy to hear. But when was the last time you complained to someone about your level of busyness? Oh, I'm, just, I'm just so busy right now. I don't have time to do that. I don't have time to go to church. I don't have time to do that study. I don't have time to, to, to have my prayer time in the morning. I, no, nobody has time to do those sorts of things and just trust that maybe God will, will forgive us through it all. But, but, you know, we've been called to something greater than just busy calendars. Now, I'm not saying that we need to, you know, quit our jobs or uh, I'm not sure who would ever suggest anything like that, but that was a joke, by the way. 
but uh, we need to do, we need to make sure that we find time to, to pencil in and plan around discipling other people, of showing others what God is doing in our life. Because above all else, that's what we've been asked to do. The second image that, or the second picture that he gives us is that of the athlete. Looking at verse 5, it says, Also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he will not be crowned as the winner unless he competes according to the rules. And all the high C personalities in the room are going, Amen, right? Because they're following the rules. And that's true. There is no cutting corners in the game of discipleship. There is no... Uh, shortcuts, no loopholes. There are, there's just one simple rule, and that is follow Jesus. And it takes time, and it's not easy. But you know, there's also something else to being an athlete that's important to know and to remember, and as part of what Paul is addressing here is that we need to prepare for the match. Right? We need to prepare for the match. It isn't just that you compete by the rules in the midst of the game or the competition, right? You must train for the match so that when that game comes, you are ready. You know what you're doing. You've got the skills necessary. And what Paul is saying is that we need to prepare for the matches of life, that we need to prepare. We need to hide the word of God in our hearts so that when we come in those times of difficulty and trials, that we can have the right word at the right time to get the victory. I love that picture that uh, of Muhammad Ali with the caption that's, He's, punch, he's hitting a punching bag, and the caption reads, the battle is won or lost long before it is ever fought. And that's so true with Christianity. If you're in the midst of a, of a decision to make, to disciple or not disciple, or even just put that aside, to, to do the righteous thing or the unrighteous thing, to sin or to not sin, and you haven't prepared in your heart for that decision, you're likely to fail. And so we must train for the match. So how are you preparing? What are you doing to have the right word at the right time to win the victory? Well, the third example that he gives is that of the farmer. The farmer. In verse 6, he says, The farmer who works hard ought to have the first share of the crops. Now, Uh, I I can tell you from my extensive years in farming just how hard it is. Again, uh, that was another joke. (laughs) So yeah, I know there are several farmers in the room. There is nothing I could ever teach you about anything that has to do with farming. I have learned a lot from you all, in fact, about farming. Now, I did garden a couple years, and uh, for two of those years, it was in Greg Thompson's garden, and, uh, and then that last year, we did his entire garden, right? And <laughs> I'd learned how hard it truly is, right? Because that's just so much ground to keep. So, all right, if you've gardened, you've been there, right? So in June, you're feeling good about your, your plants are coming up. You've been on top of the weeds. Things are looking promising, looking good. And then all of a sudden, July hits, and you've got the dog days of summer and that heat, and you have no control over the weeds anymore. You've just given up, like, all right, I'm done. You know, and it takes so much time to tend to a garden, especially one of that size that you just feel overwhelmed by it all. But what I did learn about gardening, other than how hard it really is, is that when you pull the tomato off the plant the very first time of the season, just the enjoyment of that, or the first picking of the green beans, the first harvest of the corn, the second go-around just always seems more like work to me. But that first one, that first one is sweet. And what Paul is saying to Timothy is that you need to enjoy the fruit. Enjoy the fruit. Because it is hard work. 
And there are days when it won't be fun. And there will be days of great sacrifice. And there will be days where you question, is this really all worth it? But the first time you pull something off the plant and you see the fruit, the fruit of your labor, it is enjoyment. When, you, when was the last time you saw someone take that next step in their walk with Jesus and it was something that you helped them to do? I can tell you there is no greater feeling as a minister uh, of Christ than when I see somebody taking that next step of faith you see the fruit is the best part of being a disciple maker now that is certainly a lot all packed into one little section of scripture right it contains much that is hard to hear and paul certainly knows this because he has lived it he's lived it more than perhaps anyone else And we look to Paul as the example. And because of these difficult words, Paul now motivates us with his next words. Follow along with me in verses 8 through 10. And it says, Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, a descendant of David, such is my gospel, for which I suffer hardship to the point of imprisonment as a criminal, but God's message is not imprisoned. So I endure all things for the sake of those chosen by God, that they too may obtain salvation in Christ Jesus and its eternal glory. Now, I have come to really love and appreciate this passage because Paul presents, perhaps in most simple form, his gospel. His gospel message in one sentence in verse 8. It, it, it's, verses 8 through 10 are actually, in Greek, one really long run-on sentence. All right? That happens a lot in Greek. He'd get marked down by his language arts teacher if he wrote that sentence today. And so in our New Testament Bibles, we see it broken up into three verses over three sentences, which all hang on one word, the very first word, remember. Remember. Remember what? Remember the gospel. Remember the gospel. Paul's gospel, which he presents as two important truths. The first, the first truth is that the grave is empty, that Jesus has raised from the dead, and as a result of that, the world is different. There is no, everything is different now. All things are changed because of the fact that the grave is empty. It means that the new creation has been born, inaugurated in the midst of the old. That we no longer have to follow the rules of sin and death because God has brought new life into this dead creation. And we can bear the first fruits of that and we see it in Jesus and we can see it in our lives through the presence of the Holy Spirit. And the second part of this gospel message that he declares is that Jesus is a descendant of David. And that's important because what he's saying is that Jesus is king. He is the promised Messiah, that promised son from long ago. He's finally come, and he has established his throne, and he is now king over all. And we endure all things for the sake of others, so they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus. You see, you are here today because somebody not only evangelized to you, but discipled you. And maybe that it was your parents. Maybe you still have the faith of your childhood and you cling to that faith because you had a great example. Maybe you didn't have such a great example from your parents of your faith and you came to Christ later in life because somebody showed you the difference that Jesus made in their life. And you said, I want a part of that in me. And so you have chosen now later in life to follow Jesus, and you are, you are being disciplined. But we are all here because somebody shared the gospel with us and showed us what it meant to live in Christ. Who's going to be here tomorrow? Right? New Lisbon... 
Christian church has had a faithful record of preaching the gospel, the good news. But if we aren't discipling someone else, if we aren't pouring into someone else, if we are too afraid to pull that ripcord, then there will be no New Lisbon Christian church in 50 years. There will be no church here in 100 years. And I certainly don't want that to happen. I want to pass on the legacy of New Lisbon Christian church to disciple the youth, to bring in new Christians, to bring in new believers. And we can sit here and play church all day long and one day the last person here can turn off the lights but if we don't disciple others there will be no church of tomorrow i know that's heavy and that's a lot to take in and that's a lot of responsibility but it comes back to the grace of god sure we're going to fail in this and when we do God's grace will be there with us, carrying us, picking us up, and moving along. But the mission remains the same. To share the gospel so that the church of tomorrow has a strong foundation. So who are you enduring all things for? Who are you pouring into for the church of tomorrow? You see, um, Charlie, <laughs> he, uh, he mimics me, even though he couldn't whistle that particular day. And sometimes he mimics things that I'd rather he not mimic. Uh, he, uh, he, he is <laughs> the only six-year-old with, um, with some aggression on the road. All right? <laughs> and he, and I, and so I'll, some, something will cut in front of me, and, and all of a sudden he'll be like, run over that jerk. And I'll be like, where did that come from? must be his mother but he does mimic me and he does follow me and and I, and I am working to pour into him and all of my children because that's my greatest influence is my children and perhaps your greatest influence is your children your grandchildren and maybe you've been faithful and shared the faith with them you know, he mimics other things that I like to do as well. I, I'll get out my tools and start working on a project, and he'll get out his tools. And, yeah, he has his own tools, and neither shall the two ever meet. And, uh, and so we have our own tools, and we'll, we like to work on projects together. Uh, Michigan games, he'll go up and put on his Michigan gear. Of course, that's just being a, a good father right there. And, uh, and so he, he worked. He, uh, he watches and, and enjoys Michigan as much as I do. And, you know, it wasn't that long ago he even pretended to preach. He'd be up on Hannah's bed, and they have this little table that kind of looks like a pulpit, and he's, he got up there with his Bible, and he just started telling a Bible story. And, uh, and so it's moments like that where you can see just how much influence you can have over someone else and bring about fruit in their lives so pressure for me to live the gospel is real because he is watching he is learning he along with all my children is who i'm pouring the gospel message into to pass on the faith because the gospel compels me to do so when i remember the gospel i can't help but make disciples And that's what I want to leave you all with. Remember. Remember the gospel. Remember the gospel at work, at play, with family, with strangers. Remember the gospel and share it with others and show them what God is doing in your life. Remember that the grave is empty and the impossible things are happening because the new creation has been inaugurated in the midst of the old. Remember Christ is king and the king said Go, go and make disciples. And all God's people said, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you recall to our minds daily that gospel message so that we faithfully love you, adamantly profess you, and fearlessly follow you. May the words we meditated on today bring understanding and grace and show us the one fa- show us the one father give us the strength to pull the ripcord pour into others 
sacrifice for the one, remain resolute, prepare for the match, and certainly enjoy the fruit. You are the king of kings, and we can do everything you've asked us to do. Be patient with our failures. Get glory from our successes. And it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen.